welcoming all of you to the third Ramakrishna Hindi Memorial Lecture. The first memorial lecture was delivered in 2005 by Dr. Montek Singh Alwalia, the Deputy Chairman of the Planning Commission, then the Government of India, on the topic Poverty and Development, some reflections on the Indian experience. The second lecture was in 2006, delivered by Lord Meghna Desai on the politics of poverty or the poverty of politics. This year, Mr. Rajiv Malhotra, the president of the Infinity Foundation, will deliver the Ramakrishna Hegel Memorial Lecture. Mr. Malhotra, as has just been mentioned, and as many of you might already know, is an Indian-American public intellectual and philanthropist. I thank Dr. Amit Mitra for agreeing to chair this lecture. Friends, it's a great honor for me uh, to introduce to you uh, someone who has been in some way a visionary of this nature. At the age of 40 plus, you said, I'm not going to earn money anymore, I'm going to give it. And you quit because you were in the corporate world. You gave up all that and you started a foundation. You gave your own money. You gave, you, today you've given 300 to 400 grants, I believe, for research. In uh, Princeton, New Jersey, you sit, you work on issues which are complex. The topic that you have chosen to address us, and I'm very grateful to the foundation, uh, uh, particularly to you, ma'am, for keeping this flame alive. If the topic you have chosen in consultation with the foundation is where is India in the encounter of civilizations? Thank you very much for inviting me, Patipati. It's an honor to be here and for a very grand uh, introduction. Uh, I didn't have the honor of uh, knowing or meeting uh, Mr. Hegde personally, but Patipati gave me some reading material which was very informative and very impressive. And in fact, the rise of disruptive forces, which was already referenced, uh, is extremely important uh, lecture he gave in 1992, because it resonates with a lot of my own work, and I, how I wish he were here as a, as a collaborator, because I'm trying to take uh, forward the same sort of ideas which he mentioned in 1992. And a lot of what I'm going to talk about is, is where are these disruptive forces today? It's, it turns out that the disruptive forces have become stronger, more institutionalized, more banks, more organized. But worst of all, they become internationalized and linked with global forces. So while he talks about a Khalistan movement and Northeast movement and Tibetan movement and uh, various kinds of uh, disruptive movements, in, in that era before globalization, they were contained locally within a certain space. Uh, there wasn't uh, the the connection with forces outside of the country, global nexuses, which now exist, and that will be a, a, an important part of uh, what I want to talk about. <coughs> Something happened here. Okay. Some of my research interests, uh, which are factoring into this presentation, have to do with uh, India's centrifugal forces, which is what Hegel uh, would call uh, productive forces. Centrifugal forces, as you know, are anything that tear a system apart. And these are both internal and external. The internal disruptive forces today are known as communalism, and also economic uh, disparities and social disparities of various kinds. But there is another uh, element of uh, centrifugal force added to the dimension, which is external. It is not just Pakistan uh, stirring up uh, disruptive forces in India. It's not just China stirring up uh, uh, links with Maoist forces in India. It is not just uh, the Baptist Church in North America stirring up uh, Nagaland separatism and Dravidian separatism in South India. It's all of these and more. So the, the, the centrifugal forces are more complex and globalized. But there are also centripetal forces which are opposite, which bring the nation together. The, the, for instance, uh, development of a corporate kind, uh, infrastructure building, national governance, these kind of things uh, bring the nation together. And I'm interested in what's the role of civilization in uh, preserving someone a nation's sovereignty. Uh, in other words, can a nation be sovereign very long if 
it doesn't have a cohesive shared civilization. Can a random collection of people continue to exist as a nation with all these centrifugal forces uh, unless there is something, some cohesive sense of identity that brings them together? I am also interested in the role of Indian civilization as a positive force in the world. Uh, what are its contributions to the world? That is an important uh, area of uh, my work. And finally, what are the prospects for India? And what are some of the prerequisites for India to harvest and harness this, uh, these prospects? Now, civilization, uh, briefly defined as I'm going to use it, is a shared national identity, or the collective images we have of us as a people, a collective sense of history and shared destiny, destiny that we have. It brings a deep psychological bond that makes citizens feel that the nation is worth defending. If you don't have this, then why, what is the we we're trying to defend that we are trying to make sacrifices for? So the civilization is that we, it gives that sense of we to, to, uh, in a positive sense. And breaking the civilization is like breaking the spine of somebody. Uh, and, and, and as in the case of a patient, if the social spine is broken, then the nation can be crippled and, and also behave randomly. I come across uh, cynical attitudes in India with this regard. For instance, there's people who would say there is no such thing as Indian civilization. It's a hodgepodge of uh, many things put together, and the British gave us a nation. And uh, so there's a debate on whether India is 5,000 years old or whether India is 60 years old. And that, where you end up on that debate tells a lot about your views on civilization. There are others who fail, say that if there is a civilization, it's a bad idea because it's responsible for all our problems. It's uh, what makes us primitive and oppressive and things of that sort. Then there's those who feel that civilization and identity, whatever they might have been, are obsolete. Because today we have a flat world, like uh, Thomas Friedman's flat world, and everything, you are an individual with meritocracy, and the concept of identity and groups don't matter. I disagree and I will explain later why. Uh, th there's an attitude which says differences are a bad idea. Anything that makes you different, uh, is a potential for trouble, and therefore differences are to be eliminated. I hear this quite a lot here. Uh, on the other hand, one could say that difference is to be celebrated. Uh, there is a worldview that uh, Indians have, a very ancient worldview that says difference is inherent in nature. It's an inherent part of the fabric of reality and the cosmos, plants, animals, seasons, everything. There's differences built into it. Differences are built into the way human beings are composed and our bodies and our minds and cultures and languages. So difference can be celebrated. And if you learn how to celebrate difference, which I feel is the quintessential Indian contribution in civilization, then you do not have the problems which you have if you feel that difference has to be eliminated. Because the moment you say difference has to be eliminated, well, do you change to me, to my way, uh, to eliminate difference? <laughs> Uh, do I convert you to be like me so we don't feel anxiety over difference? Uh, do I genocide you because it bothers me that we are different so I get rid of you? Do I enslave you? All these are things that have happened in the name of eradicating difference to have one word. And it actually creates more problems uh, as opposed to learning how to live with difference and celebrate it. Uh, finally, even discussing the topic of an encounter of civilizations is often viewed with great suspicion. People think there's some kind of a conspiracy theory going on or some kind of a negative thing going on and wouldn't we be better off if we just talked about how everything is great and we are singing and dancing and doing manga together, kind of like a Bollywood ending. Is, I'm often told, make sure you have a Bollywood ending when you talk. So I'm not sure I'll live up to that. And there's also another attitude uh, prevailing which I call escapism. And escapism is this very lofty and uh, apathetic a kind of approach, moralizing, which says things like there is no other, we believe in everything, all paths lead to the same goal, we survive for 5,000 years and we survive no matter what, we have the truth and the mantras and the deities on our side, and in any case it's all Maya and Mithya, so why bother? Now, uh, to those of you who are my spiritual friends, a lot of you are in the audience, uh, I, this is a topic of uh, conversation that we can take on. But even the great spiritualists like Sri Aurobindo actually wrote very aggressively against this mindset as a defeatist, otherworldly, world negating mindset which is not what true spirituality is about and it is about engaging the world and dealing with issues. Then there's another kind of escapism which accepts the problems but does not accept the responsibility and tends to say it's someone else's problem 
like you know, we should get USA to do this for us. America should come and solve the terrorist problem somewhere, kind of thing. Or we have to figure out, well, if you don't like America, then maybe Russia is better. As if you know, we have to put ourselves for adoption. Somebody has to adopt us. And I keep saying it, an elephant is too big to be adopted. You just cannot uh, be looking to, in today's world for a benevolent uh, guardian, parent. You have to learn to look after yourself. And that is what the message of my talk is. That looking at all the options, you have to come down and take responsibility for India and its civilization. The topic of my talk starts with, uh, I want to recollect uh, the Hegde's uh, uh, 1992 speech on the rise of disruptive forces, uh, in which he lists half a dozen uh, what, I, what I call fragments. Uh, he he calls them disruptive forces. And these are uh, identities or sub-nations within India that have a hard time with the rest of India. He says that for thousands of years, these uh, groups did not have this kind of a problem with each other and with the nation. They were okay. And they would leave each other alone. And uh, this business of intervening too much into their internal affairs has caused a reaction from these groups. And so they are becoming disruptive. Uh, I, uh, as the talk goes on, you will see that I am actually picking that theme and making and seeing how it has developed over the last 16, 17 years since he made that talk, and how these disruptive forces have become fragments, and how these fragments have become global movements, some of them, with India as a sort of epicenter of these global movements. Uh, I will uh, present uh, three scenarios for India's future, based on looking at the global civilizational uh, encounters and internal fragments that are in uh, tension with each other. Uh, uh, scenario A is where I'll spend a lot of my time. It is a negative scenario and it has to be discussed and understood before we can move on. And that scenario says that India's fragments on these disruptive forces uh, are going to get taken over as parts of uh, some part will go to the West and some part will belong to an Islamic expansion and some part China will take over. And so India may actually be disintegrated or large parts of it may be taken over. And this is what I call the fragmentation and uh, disintegration of India scenario. And I will talk a, a fair amount about this. Second is that uh, there are people who say uh, India is not a nation but a culture. So what India are you talking about? It's a culture. And why are you trying to defend a nation? There's no nation. We are a value system. We have ideas and ideals. And as long as the culture lives, uh, whether the nation lives is immaterial. And uh, there is this mindset, a lot of people are here discuss, saying that. And I will discuss this B, scenario B, as basically uh, short-lived. If B happens, then soon it will be A. Soon India will not exist, nor will its culture, because once the nation is not there as a container, as the vehicle, the vessel, which nurtures and protects and projects this culture, and, and this culture sort of scatters and is eaten up by various other civilizations, soon uh, it, it will also dissolve. It will become part of various other entities and lose its, lose its uh, original uh, self. And then scenario C is a positive one, which says that India emerges as a thriving nation state with its own civilization and helps the world. So really A and C are the two scenarios. B is sort of a very graceful and dignified way of ending up in A. It's a way of saying, okay, we lose with honor. Uh, we are finished, but we will say we are we won because our culture thrives. Okay, so it's like the deer saying, so what? The tiger will eat me up, but in the belly of the tiger I will be alive. And you know, the tiger runs fast, and I will be running fast, and I'll be part of his DNA, and I will nurture him and uh, make him a loving creature from within. But it doesn't work because after the deer has been eaten, the tiger remains a tiger. He's just a stronger tiger. So scenario B is kind of a, a delusionary uh, a kind of attitude you hear very often, particularly from very spiritual people who will say, you know, what nation, what do you want to defend? Uh, the culture is good, it's doing well, they'll, they'll eat our food and listen to our music and do our yoga and, and wear our clothes and that and Bollywood they watch. And so it doesn't matter you know, whether there's India or not because we are basically a culture and that will survive. Now, globalization intensifies the competition among civilizations because there are some factors driving this competition, such as scarcity for world resources, growth of population, <laughs> increasing expectations. Uh, people everywhere in the world want to live this page three American lifestyle. Everybody wants to be like that. But there aren't enough resources in the world to have 
Uh, soon there'll be 9 billion people by the middle of the century, and there just aren't enough resources to make that possible. And then there is the collective power of group identity. Groups are coalescing. Uh, rather than group identity is going away, it is not happening. The opposite is happening. Certainly, if you know in India, uh, the, the whole vote banks are intensifying, and that's group identities. So if it's happening in India, why would you expect it's not happening elsewhere? Uh, so on a global scale, it's the same thing. Uh, what we call vote bank identity politics is the same sort of thing which is happening in the, on a civilizational level, where people feel that if they are able to negotiate and bargain and use groups uh, collectively, uh, then they can get a better deal. So this is not, uh, this intensified competition is not uh, going away. The reality, I feel, is that the West, China, Pan-Islam, each publicly project their claim of superior civilization and future domination of the world. And the United States certainly feels it's the leader and doesn't want to give that up. Uh, China certainly feels that by the middle of this century, it wants to be number one in the world in every respect. That is a claim, it is public, there is nothing to be embarrassed about, they're not shy of it. And Islam has a, has a doctrinal commitment to dominating the world. It's a doctrinal commitment. I realize that my term West is not as simple as that. America is separate, Europe is separate. But I'm going to use it in a, in a way, my thesis is already very complex. And instead of having three civilizations, I could have put five or eight. It would not change the bottom line as far as India is concerned. So I'm using three. I also realize that Islam is complex and there are many factions and many kinds of forces within Islam. But for my purposes, just calling it Islam suffices. Now these top three civilizations have the following uh, attributes. Uh, each has a collective superego with common values. Uh, each has a very chauvinistic grand narrative of history. Who we are, our ancestors, how they were great, and all of the glorifying ideas and stories about them. Each is committed to achieving global domination. Uh, each actively nurtures its civilization and projects it via academics, education, media, and its policies. These are the, so it is not something that is on the fringes. This is very consciously done by each of these. The United States has got major projects about its sense of history, its founding fathers, its parades, its monuments in Washington, presidential libraries, the great flag everywhere, even in front of a car dealership or in front of a gas station, great flag. A sense of nation, patriotism is larger than life. And this is not going away, in fact, it is getting stronger. Uh, this, all of this counteracts this idea that we live in the flat world where, you know, my merit counts and so on. Now, here I've taken a grid. I've put the three civilizations I'm talking about in this study. And then I'm looking at what are the success factors. Uh, well, I already talked about historical identity and a sense of manifest destiny is a success factor. But also modern institutions are important as a sense of uh, strength uh, that uh, you can rate all the civilizations. This grid I use in workshops with Westerners, with Chinese people, Islamic, and try to figure out their ideas of who's where on this grid. And it's very, very interesting. Uh, to do this kind of exercise. Now, the modern institutions have three forms of capital. Uh, there is financial capital, uh, there is uh, political military capital, and there is intellectual capital. Now, uh, we have a Varna system, uh, which also I see Varna as a form of capital. Uh, I don't see Varna as caste or lineage of birth and all that. I see the Varnas are forms of capital. And the uh, financial capital is the Vashya. The Vashya Varna is a is commerce. So Bill Gates and uh, Warren Buffett would be American bashes. And uh, Kshatriyas are political military capital. So governance, law, courts, Supreme Court, uh, United Nations, international treaties, not just military, but all governance uh, is Kshatriya capital. Uh, and and uh, nations and civilizations need that. Intellectual capital, we all know, is knowledge, know-how, that is Brahmanical capital. So one could also say that the job of a modern institution and a civilization uh, is to enhance uh, its uh, Vashya capital, its uh, Kshatriya capital, and its uh, Brahminical capital. And this is a very different view than the caste view. I'm, I'm viewing them as uh, forms of capital. Now, if you look at China, they have a very explicitly stated plan and ambition to be the world leader by the middle of the century 
in economic, military, and civilizational terms. They have a, constructed a grand narrative of China, which has been formulated and projected. And it talks about starting uh, 5,000 years ago in Confucianism, and how there's a great China story, and how they become modern, and now they're moving on to the future. This is a very seamless, continuous story that they've constructed, and this is what they're teaching uh, their, their, their people and projecting. They are doing a major promotion of Chinese positive history. Not that we are ashamed and we are guilty and we have abused people. Uh, we, we should be sorry for ourselves and we should apologize for our civilizations. Not that. In fact, I've done a study of China in Harvard versus India in Harvard. And it's like night and day. Uh, in the, the, I've looked at what are their topics of uh, public talks and the courses they offer and dissertations on China and uh, contrast with India, uh, and, and uh, I can get into that later if somebody wants, but I'm actually writing a report on uh, how China has projected itself in a very positive, as a very positive civilization. <laughs> India actually has not. They've done, they have 100 Confucian Studies chairs established worldwide uh, with the help of the government and the <laughs> private sector, uh, the, the, the entrepreneurs, and China institutes are in San Francisco, New York, all kinds of places. Chinese insist that they have their own modernization, which is not westernization. As what they are saying is, we're telling our youth, modernize, but we have a Chinese approach to modernity. And that doesn't mean you have to mimic the West. And you modernize, you get all the consumer goods, and you, you, know, you, you live the modern life, technology, and all that, but there's a Chinese uh, philosophical and civilizational ethos behind it. So while in India, we often hear, do you want to remain traditional, or do you want to become modern, which means you've got to westernize? As if you cannot be uh, modern in an Indian context with, the, with an Indian civilizational approach to modernity. That sort of is considered an oxymoron in India, but China actually insists that they have their own modernity. Pan-Islam has a theological grand narrative from God. China it does not claim that their grand narrative comes from God. It is something they made up and uh, you know, built up over time. Uh, but the Islamic narrative comes from God, which gives them identity, meaning, and direction. They have a sacred geography. So the Kaaba, for example, is uh, sacred, and you cannot point at uh, Jama Masjid uh, to pray. You have to point a particular place to pray. So that sacred geography is unique. It's unique uh, powers in certain areas. There's a literalist account of history. A literalist meaning you cannot say it's metaphorical, uh, these are all metaphorical things going on, and we can reinterpret them for today. Uh, they are considered to be actual historical events that happened, and so you cannot mess with it. Because when God is one of the protagonists in a historical event, then you better not uh, try to update what he might have said. You cannot say, I'll amend it, because God is spoken, and it's literal history. Uh, there's also a preordained trajectory to the future. So not only is the past fixed, but the future is also preordained, and you have to live in accordance to achieve that. And th so there is this idea of us versus them, the Darul Islam versus Darul Harb. And this is uh, there in the Islamic doctrine. But Islam is not just one monolithic entity. There are cultural variations, at least four. I mean, you have the Arab, uh, uh, Arabic version and the Persian version, which is Shiite, is very different. Language is different. Their idea of their history and links with Islam is very different. And then there is the Indic or South Asian Islam, which is very eclectic, uh, which is very sort of the most liberal of the lot, and, uh, uh, and probably a, a very important asset for Indian civilization is to harmonize with this Islam, because that is highly exportable model. Uh, the rest of the world has to learn how to live with Islam, and India has the longest experience of doing that. So this Indian Islam, which is very different than the rest, uh, hopefully cannot, can remain like that and not be modified and taken over by uh, you know, Saudi Islam and so on, which it might. Then there is a Western is, uh, version of Islam. In Europe and the United States, the uh, people who are Islamic are creating a whole new uh, political and social uh, value system. And finally, there are fringe movements uh, to liberalize. But they are fringe movements. They do not have the center of power. Uh, they, are, they are not able to even stand up in their own country and assert uh, with, uh, with confidence uh, and fearlessly. Uh, and basically the reformation of Islam uh, is where the reformation movement of Christianity started. 
And, and, and once the Christianity, the, the Reformation movement started in Europe, it took 200 years of fighting and all kinds of things before the Reformation could be firmly established and before the church state could be separated and the bishop bishops went back to the church and no longer had fatwa-like powers, which they used to have at one point. They had police powers and they used to rule with the same kind of tyranny and oppression that you know an imam or a mullah can issue a fatwa today. So Christians have a reference point to understand Christian, to understand Islam because Islam is sort of pre-Reformation Christianity in, in terms of uh, its stage today. Now I'm going to focus on the United States to give you a kind of a what's the worst case scenario of how a foreign civilization can come and in, in, to intervene. And I don't do this because uh, I have a problem with the United States. In fact, I live there, I love it. I think it's India's best ally uh, as a, as a, in terms of another civilization. But I think Indians must understand the complexity of America and, and uh, that America does not have just one point of view and there is no stable point of view, it keeps shifting. Just like in India, there are many points of view on a complex issue, and the view keeps shifting from time to time. So United States, uh, the scenario I'm going to develop, also applies to Islam and China and other civilizations. But I focus on the United States because I've lived there for 38 years, I know it very well, I've studied it, its history for the last 10 years, it's a very systematic uh, pursuit of mine, and uh, therefore I feel I can uh, talk with greater confidence. But at the same thing I'm saying would also, a similar things apply to other civilizations. Now, USA also has some very positive things on India. Uh, let's start with that. There's a business success, so PT would vouch for that. And uh, I'm also a product of the business success of uh, US. Uh, America's gifts to India's youth, both for higher education and career opportunities, are pretty well known. America has a love affair with Indian pop culture. That is also very encouraging. And India is America's friend after 9-11. These are some of the positive things you can list. Uh, and then there's military alliance and there's many other things. Uh, however, America's outlook is far more complex and unstable. And this is where I'm going to develop a scenario. Now, I'm going to start by explaining that America, before you talk about India, America has its own problems both with China and with Islam. America has a dual psychosis, a civilizational threat it perceives from China and from Islam. The, I'll talk with the left-hand side of the chart first and then the right-hand side. The left-hand side is a clash with China and I call it the clash of modernities. It's a clash of modernities because China is saying we are, we are, having an, uh, we are going to compete on modernity. We're not competing on religion or, 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 or ideology. We're competing on modernity industrial economy, military, political power, materialism, consumerism. So we are going to become more American than the Americans in a sense. Uh, and and uh, this is hitting America at, its, at, at the core of its uh, modern society, modern industrial complex society. I call this the father-son clash because China's uh, industry is a sort of, of uh, has been produced and exported by the United States. The United States sent the capital to China from the Nixon Kissinger era. Uh, they sent the uh, uh, industries, the technology, the machines, and they bought the finished goods. So the United States actually transplanted its entire industrial complex and shipped it off the Pacific Ocean to China. And so now the son, which is China, says, thank you, Dad. I learned this from you. You gifted it to me. I have improved upon it. Now I can do better than you. And guess what? I'm actually going to take you over. I'm taking it. I'm, I'm going to be more better at this uh, modernity than you are. So there is a father-son clash of modernity going on, and that is one of the two psychoses of uh, the United States. The other psychosis, which is on the right-hand side, is a clash of fundamentalisms. The Islam is not looking for modernity. They are not clashing because they have better machines and better factories, and they'll export more consumer goods. They just don't not want. They're not worrying about that. They are, they are competing against uh, the fundamentalist Christianity and it's a rival claim over historical prophets, each having finality, each Christianity and Islam claiming that they have God's franchise for man. God gave them the franchise. He gave them the exclusive franchise and the other franchise is, not, is bogus, it's not valid. And, and they have the franchise to take over the world. So this uh, fundamentalism versus fundamentalism on, you know, between American Christianity and Islam is also a father-son clash. 
in the sense that uh, Islam is, a, is, an off, is, is an offspring of the lineage of uh, Christian, uh, Jewish Christian prophets. So uh, it's, the, it's very interesting that uh, uh, Islam has a sort of uh, offspring or, uh, or a sequel to Christianity uh, is now taking on its own father. So it says uh, uh, we respect uh, Jesus and we respect the prior prophets and what they said is true and we should certainly respect them but our prophet is more recent and supersedes. It's like a lawyer saying uh, the contract you have is valid but I have a more recent version and a more recent version supersedes the old version. Not that your version is wrong but my version is better because it's newer. So this is also the son taking on the father on the father's own terms. So you can see the United States got a real problem because the United States is, consists of, you know, you think of the red states and blue states sometimes, the Christian uh, ethos and the very modern, enlightened, secular ethos. Now both these are being threatened uh, by, by two offsprings, two civilizations, which are, ironically America has created. And America has gifted them the tools the, in, in, in a sense, in a, in a metaphorical sense. So how does this play into India? Uh, you see the China threat on one side, the Islamic threat on the other side, and ch the challenged America one is therefore it got a schizophrenic attitude towards India, which is what I will explain here. And it is hedging its bets on India. That is why it's impossible to characterize America one way or the other with respect to India on a long term basis. And this is, uh, I'm going to go to the left hand side of the slide first, which is, which is the, the move to build up India. And the right hand side of the slide says fragment India, two opposing uh, views towards India. The build up India voices in American uh, think tanks and American policy and so on are saying let's invest in India, financial capital, market and labor, let's have military alliances, let's have regional political alliances. And the benefit is it will counter China's hegemony, it will contain the Islamic threat, there, it's good for US corporate interests and India will be a stabilizing force in the third world. But, at the bottom, it also says, if this happens too much, then we have a long-term competitor. If India is too successful and in, in this, then we have another China-like threat. Uh, one China is bad enough. What if another billion people became another kind of China and as successful in competing against us, then we have to worry about two, two kind of Chinas. And so, that, uh, while there is a voice that says, let's build up India, there is also the voice that is concerned that it may get out of hand and become too strong. So therefore, to counterbalance, there is the right-hand side, which says fragment India. And this fragment India is a much older voice than the build-up India. The build-up India is more of a corporate voice and a political voice over the last 10 years. But the fragmentation of India voice has been there since the Cold War. Since the 50s and 60s, the United States has had this attitude that uh, let's divide and rule. And they built up this Dravidian, uh, Anna Durai was uh, built up, all kinds of uh, movements were built up to fragment India and play one against the other. Uh, when Nehru was pro-Soviet, then the United States helped uh, Davidians, uh, you know, to counteract uh, Nehru's uh, program to unify India. So the fragmentation of India is a very old uh, policy, and it says uh, exploit Dalits versus Brahmins, uh, Dravidians versus so-called Aryans, women versus men, minorities versus Hindus. And the benefits to India, uh, the, the proponents of this have said that it avoids a, a China-like competitor. Uh, you can still outsource and use those laborers. Uh, you can have a whole lot of uh, cheap labor in India, but they'll never get out of hand, they'll never be too strong, they'll never be organized to compete against you. You can still use them on your terms and they keep them weak. Uh, it will also accelerate evangelism because when a state is weak, then uh, evangelists uh, have a clear, clearer path, no, less resistance to what they're trying to do. And what a great market for weapons exporters. Imagine if there's an army of Gujarat wants to buy tanks and the army of uh, Maharashtra wants to buy anti-tank missiles. What a great thing for the <coughs> arms merchants. They, they, their stock will go up if there's a, a, a disruption. Uh, and, uh, if the disruptive forces of Hekte uh, become a uh, civil war, uh, it will be good news for the weapons exporters. Now, the United States is also very concerned if this fragmentation of India happens. Uh, it's good to talk about, it's good to hedge your beds, it's good to plant some seeds and have some sleeper cells, but if it actually materializes, then it's the worst nightmare for the United States. 
to have it in RT or a chaos in India, uh, which would be like uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iraq, and 10 times the size. It would be absolutely uh, the worst thing, worst nightmare for the United States would be the fragmentation of India. So I call this the mother-in-law syndrome that the United States faces. Do I want the couple to be united and happy, or do I want them to fall apart? Well, if they're too united, then they don't listen to me. I don't have a voice. I can't meddle, and, and I don't have a power. So I got to go in and meddle around and power and play one against the other and break apart, you know, make some frictions. But then if they threaten they want to divorce and go, go away, then I, I'm gone. I don't, I'm in trouble. So I kind of play between these two poles and don't want either pole to happen too much. So United States policy towards India we keep vacillating between these two poles of build up India and fragment India. And I do not think that you can expect a very long term stability either way. Now, I also have been studying for the past decade various US interventions in India. And this is a very simplified chart of how the, at the top is the United States Academy, government, church, funding agencies, how they work together. And they funnel money, influence, ideology, training, leadership training, all kinds of things down into the India. Uh, in, and the India receives it through the academy, journalists, funding agencies, church subsidiaries, NGOs, and so on. So this is uh, this is a, a kind of uh, an asymmetry because India doesn't do this up in the other direction. And the way this uh, India is deconstructed by the this is the side that is the uh, fragment India camp in the United States. They look at they look at India both through the secular lenses. Uh, shown on the left, and the biblical lenses shown on the right, and in between are the problems that they study. So the first uh, building blocks are to study caste, uh, minorities, uh, women, and to keep showing that they are problems, they are being oppressed, and civilization is bad. And then this feeds into a, a negative uh, approach to Hinduism, and then the negative approach to Hinduism feeds uh, a negative approach to Indian civilization. And finally, at the top is a group of scholars who look at why India is not a valid book, uh, nation state, what is wrong with it, and all its human rights problems and other kinds of problems. So this is a kind of a, a deconstruction of India template, if you will, which is quite commonly found in South Asian studies. By the way, I've looked at the last 32 years of conferences on South Asia, which are held in Madison every year. I got all the proceedings and abstracts, and they were surprised that somebody wanted to buy all of them is that this is a very anti-progressive country uh, which is primitive, frozen in time, poverty causing. It's like a patient with caste, sati, dowry, piti side, all these things. And we are the doctors who can solve it. Mm -hmm. uh, India is uh, mystical, uh, West is rational. Whenever I hear this very common st st statement in the United States, I tell them, look, chances are your doctor is uh, Indian. Okay, now he's not irrational, he's not some mystical fellow. And chances are that uh, you know, a lot of technology you're using is Indian, and those are not a bunch of mystical uh, people. They're pretty rational people. So why do you keep thinking that way? And, and this is just one of those old stereotypes that doesn't go away. And then there is this idea that everything good about India was imported into India. So the so-called Aryans brought Sanskrit. The Greeks brought philosophy and rational thought. Hinduism was a colonial construction in the British era. Uh, Indian culture was started by the Mughals with uh, chicken tikka and uh, sitar. And the British gave Indians a nation and a cricket team. And now we have to import our human rights from America. So everything should be everything we need we should import. And I call this the invasion theory of India, which means if we want something, we should select who's the best invader, who will give it to us and invade, because then we, we don't have any selfhood, we do not have a civilization. Uh, uh, we need to be invaded to have something of value. And this means we are doomed to dependency also. Now what got me started on this course of understanding America's uh, intervention with uh, India's breakup was a very interesting meeting I had with a scholar in Princeton University. We were just sitting and having lunch, and uh, he had just come back from India, and I said, what did you do in India? Oh, he said, oh, I went as part of the afro Dalit project. And I said, what is this afro Dalit project? He said, oh, afro Dalit project, I have been going to India, and we do youth empowerment and uh, training and uh, afro Dalit project. So I said, this is very fascinating. I never heard of such a thing. Can you tell me what it is? And he said, you know, the, you know, we're, we know the, who the Dalits are. I said, yeah, who are they? He said, well, they are Africans. They are blacks of India. And uh, the non-Dalits are the whites of India. And uh, this is a, a 
black white uh, history of India, uh, which is mirroring the black white history in America. And uh, the Afro Dalit project is to educate our Dalit brothers that this is what uh, you've been subject to. So this was amazing to me. So I went and did some Google searches and I started my project, this whole project started by researching the Afro Dalit project. And I built a huge library of what they're up to and who funds them. Uh, and they are, they are very uh, much active in uh, Tamil Nadu, uh, building up a whole network of youth, and they do youth empowerment, youth training, uh, to give them an alternative sense of history, that they are historically uh, a kind of oppressed people by non-religions and, uh, and things of that sort. And the church has a very good vested interest in it, because if you can dislocate their identity from the rest of India, then you can also reprogram them and give them a new, uh, a new religion and so on. And this is called the Dalit Stan Project. So I invited myself to this scholar's office and I saw this map. There's a map of Dalit Stan that he got hanging there. On the north, on the northern part is Mughalstan, which is from Afghanistan, Pakistan, all the way to Bangladesh, northern India, it's Mughalstan. And this is sort of the, this turns out to be what uh, Mullah Omar says. He says he wants to put the flag of uh, Taliban on Red Fort of Delhi and recreate the Mughal Empire. That is his agenda. And uh, the southern part of India is Dalitstan and Dravidstan. So these guys are working on it. So I was very amazed that nobody talks about it. I never heard anyone notice it. And yet these guys have an open project. If you go to Google and search, search Afro Dalit, you will come across a lot of hits. Please do that. So anyway, then I started getting deeper into it. And I found that there is, a, there is merit in a thesis which says that local minorities are being appropriated by global nexuses. Uh, uh, the Afro Dalit being just one example. So Hegde's disruptive forces of 1992 have now turned into a frontier mindset. So India is now a frontier of uh, these kind of uh, wild things happening. Local minority is co-opted as a branch office of some global nexus. Many minorities are part of some global majority and are used for transnational agendas. Uh, third world intellectual franchises are set up to deconstruct their own nations. It's very interesting that America's own sense of nation is becoming stronger and stronger, and also the, the nation in, in China, the nation of Russia, the nation of Japan, and, you know, those guys are not deconstructing, and they are not going out of style. Uh, uh, and the European Union is becoming a very strong super nation. But somehow the intellectual fashion of the day being exported to Indian intellectuals, the third world intellectuals, is please go back to your country and deconstruct yourself. And, uh, you know, we haven't asked them to first do it to themselves. Now you will say that uh, there is a lot of postmodernism in American campuses and they are doing it to themselves also. But they are doing it from the fringes. The people who are doing it do not have clout. They do not have, nobody takes them seriously. The media doesn't uh, court these kind of people. They, just, they are not policy makers. They do not influence uh, think tanks. They are just some uh, in a cocoon in the academy uh, doing some deconstruction of America. But the powers to be are very patriotic and the nation state is as, as strong as ever. So this also led me to question the definition of minority. And I want to leave this provocation with you. Uh, if you were at a McDonald's in Delhi, and you have a local establishment with 20 employees, uh, you would not say this is a minority establishment. You would quickly say this is part of a global empire. This is part of a huge global multinational. Someone could say that all these 20s are, uh, are from minority classes in India. And you would still not be convinced. Because as individuals working there, there may be minorities in their personal capacity. But the institution they're working for is a branch office of a large multinational and not a minority. Now, why not apply? Why would you not apply the same thing uh, if the Southern Baptist Church or the Baptist Church, which is a huge multinational, set up a big network of churches in Nagaland and in Tamil Nadu and uh, they have a plan of 20,000 churches in South India. So why would you call those minorities? and not call them branch offices or subsidiaries of a global multinational. Why is it that if the product being sold is God's love, then all of a sudden the rules of multinationals don't apply just because they're selling God's love and therefore it's God's love is exempt from scrutiny and transparency. I would submit to you that the definition of minority has to be modulated and if a minority is working for, funded by, appointed by, trained by a, a, a foreign global nexus, then it is not really a minority. It is a part of a big enterprise, and that enterprise should be studied rather than this isolated 20, 30 people in a place being called a minority. So I even provoke you to rethink the definition of 
minority itself in this age of globalization. Now there's a new positive India discourse in the US business schools. This is what Fiki, I think, and myself, we, I am also from a similar background of industry. This is the discourse we like to hear. And finally, the India's time has come because I've lived there for 38 years and only in the last several years, this new positive discourse has started. Otherwise, it was all this other kind of discourse that I mentioned earlier. Now, there's a positive focus on investments, markets, labor pools, and all of that. So what we have are two competing discourses. There's a positive discourse which says, build up India. And this is primarily in business schools. So when my friends want to donate something to, for the study of South Asia or India, I always tell them, give it to the business school. Don't give it to South Asian studies. Because South Asian studies are built on the fragmentation of India, the why India is a problem kind of thesis, uh, built on the old humanities and social sciences. Yeah. Yeah. And now the irony is that both these views are also entrenched in India. In India also, you have the technocrats, industrialists, uh, those kind of people who believe in a positive sense of India. And then you also have uh, people in the social sciences, and uh, a lot of those social science theories they've imported, they've been franchised and all that. Uh, not that problems don't exist, but they, they really don't have that much faith in uh, India as a nation. So you have both voices uh, within India also. Now this is a potentially troubling slide, as if the previous ones were not, but this one may be more troubling. I'm going to give you a hypothetical scenario for US intervention in India. Uh, suppose South Asia becomes the epicenter of USA versus Islam, which can happen. And it's no longer Iraq, it's no longer anywhere else, it's in South Asia. And they land, they double the troops in Afghanistan, which the Obama wants to, which they have no choice, I think they have to. But suppose the Taliban take over Pakistan, which is something 10 years ago I wrote a paper on it, and nobody wanted to publish it, they thought it's too sensational. But today they think it's a realistic possibility. Uh, the, the way it would happen is Taliban take over ISI, and ISI take over the Pakistan army indirectly, and Pakistan army, we know, runs Pakistan. So you could have a democratically elected facade, a nice, uh, nice front uh, for PR purposes, but they really don't make the decisions, they don't call the shots, they don't have any power. It's even worse than having Musharraf, because at least there it was transparent that you're dealing with the army. Now they'll be able to fool you into thinking that you're dealing with some other group which who really don't have any power. So let's say under such a scenario, Taliban take over Pakistan, and so now you have a nuclearized uh, Taliban. Uh, and let's say I mean, the US is fighting, but uh, you know years go on, and the casualties build up, and the US got economic pressures at home, and another election is coming. So this turns into Obama's Iraq. So it turns into this, this fight in this Afghanistan, Pakistan against Taliban escalates and it becomes Obama, Obama's liability and then there is a desperation to exit, but exit with honor. So let's say a few, uh, Obama or a future president has to then figure out a way of exiting. Now when the US exits, after having flared it up, it's going to be a pretty bad mess that somebody has to then encounter. And then guess who is going to get the brunt of it? And I think that would be India. And I, I, I would also uh, uh, surmise in this hypothesis that uh, Taliban will then have their, uh, their vision of uh, setting up that Mughal Stan, which was in the map earlier. They will say, we also have enough disruptive forces sitting in India that we can incite. And we can then get going a huge revolution to do this. The United States are not going to help. They are gone. And they already tried it. They are gone. And now we are going to take, take over. United States, number two, the United States may also have another kind of intervention in India, which is to safeguard Christians being persecuted. Now you may think this is a far-fetched thing, but there was a Wall Street, what started me on this research path was a Wall Street Journal front page article uh, two, three years ago, titled, uh, U.S. Evangelists Driving Foreign Policy Interventions. Uh, you know, if you want, I'll get you the URL of that. A very long article. Which, which showed that there's a 100 year history of evangelicals not only driving domestic policies on abortion and gays and nowadays on stem cell research, very successfully they've been able to uh, modulate policy, but also very strong on foreign policy. And on foreign policy what they want is that, that the United States should intervene wherever there's a pocket of Christians who are considered to be under threat. And once the United States agrees that that is a policy, then they go and actually sometimes stir up trouble 
and use that to bring the United States intervention in there. Now the dossier of such cases of uh, uh, persecution of uh, Christians in India is growing. It is well protected. It's a huge dossier sitting in the United States. You can go to various places and you can see all their cases, their footage and all that. And there are hearings regularly in Washington when we say invite those Indians who have a complaint and the wrong line of such people who want the visa and they want a travel grant to go and give testimony before the US Congress. Um, also, there are well-organized networks in India which have been funded by these, uh, these, by these entities to provoke trouble, to monitor the so-called persecution, and then to go report it and lobby in Washington. It's very interesting every time I uh, search on uh, India or persecution in the world or anything, Every day I get some hits on something happened in India somewhere. And, uh, and this is all, all over the US media and, and lobbying, in, uh, there are groups uh, lobbying this in uh, Washington. So the United States may decide that, okay, the Taliban got North India, we'll go and get, uh, we'll uh, intervene and create a sort of a Christianized uh, uh, pockets here and there, maybe South India or something, because we built up our own base, we built up a, a network of support. So this is a sort of a worst case scenario of, uh, of a possible intervention. Now, similar analyses also apply to Islam and China intervening. Uh, each of them has uh, stakes in India, ambitions in India. Uh, you have to do scenarios like what if China, Pakistan jointly take military action. China would love to have Arunachal Pradesh because of the water, the Brahmaputra River water, which can be then taken to uh, Tibet. Uh, China would love to take over Nepal because most of the water that comes to the Ganga comes from Nepal filters down. Uh, what comes out of the glacier in the Gothri and Gaumuk is only a small part of the water. The rainwater and the snow water from Nepal that comes down is the majority of the water. So this fight over water makes certain geography very strategic and China would love to have all this. Uh, so these are my, you could build more scenarios of type A which show that the globalization of, uh, brings civilizational threats to India. Now I want to go to part two. In a few minutes I want to go very quickly because we don't have much time. Uh, and I want you to sort of set aside everything I said because that may be very disturbing. And now we think of what is positive that India can offer to the world. What, how could India be a successful civilization and do positive things? So to start with, what are the problems the world faces when India may offer a solution? And I su suggest three. One is that development, this idea of economic development, is not sustainable or scalable. It is not, uh, it is not ecologically possible to have development of such a large number of people and achieve the per capita consumption of the Western standard. Uh, it is just not achievable. And it, you, so you can't scale it to the whole world and you can't sustain it over a long period of time. And then the Abrahamic civilizations are based on the claim of exclusivity and a mandate to take over the world. And that is not going to sustain a peaceful environment. And finally, the human rights uh, that exist today, the human rights laws, they protect individuals, they do not protect cultures. And there's no law broken if a language is made extinct, or if your culture or your rituals are gone. I mean, the, if you as an individual are not violated, then, you know, the culture as an entity does not have a status. An individual has a status. So, I won't go through this slide in detail because this would be a whole presentation by itself on what are, what are some of the contributions that Indian civilization can make. But I'll just do a headline scan. There's a large uh, reservoir of know-how, of uh, consciousness, uh, uh, consciousness development and enhancement, what is called mind sciences, uh, intuition, creativity. Uh, this is now at the cutting edge of Western research in cognitive sciences, neurosciences, psychology. And this, uh, this is an asset that India has, which actually is being acknowledged by the scientific community. So India brings a lot in this dimension. There is a whole, uh, a whole uh, worked out system in Indian society of ecological sustainability, starting with uh, uh, being content with less consumerism. Uh, and the whole ashrama model, where you divide life into stages, and you are a consumerist in the second stage, when you are in the hust. But in the stages before and after that, you learn life to be happy without too much consumerism. So there's social models where, which may be of application to a, a kind of world order where you cannot have this everybody live like to be a hundred years old and consumer is from zero to one weight uh, at, the, at the American level. Uh, then there is this concept of 
groups that are decentralized and self-organized without reporting to, without a state, a very centralized government, uh, authoritarian government running the show. So this is a very old Indian uh, social organization which is highly decentralized and the groups do not need someone else to uh, give them uh, laws and commandments and stuff like that. They're pretty self-organized. And there's a bunion tree metaphor sometimes used to describe this kind of Indian society that it's not one trunk and one root system but lots of it. And all of this results in pluralism, uh, dignified aging. There is a, uh, in India, I think aging is dignified. You don't end up in an old age home, and uh, now because of modernity, you do. Because old age homes are starting here, because that we have a similar tendency to westernize. But the tradition has a dignified aging uh, built into it, and a, and a kind of social security from your community. The Jati was a social security network. And you break families now, you break Jati's structure, by making it into caste. So who's going to give you old age security? The state doesn't have the money. Even in the United States, the, the social security is going broke. So I don't think in a country like India, we can have uh, social security from a modern concept. So these are some ideas <laughs> for an Indian civilizational contribution. Now I want to introduce two archetypes. I call them the yogi archetype and the gladiator archetype for civilizations. Uh, the yogi archetype is uh, uh, illustrated by Emperor Ashoka, who was a gladiator. He was a fiery, uh, you know, angry kind of uh, fierce man committing a lot of bloodshed. And he surrenders to the yoga, he gives up his army, and he becomes a Buddhist and uh, uh, tells his monks to be become Buddhist. So the, the gladiator surrenders to the yoga. Uh, while in the case of Emperor Constantine, the opposite happens. Emperor Constantine is a gladiator, and he has a Jesus experience, he has a Christ experience. But rather than surrendering his gladiator nature and becoming the yogi in the true spirit of Christ, he actually captures Christianity, captures Christ and turns him into a weapon to become for imperialism. Uh, he takes the vision of the cross and he says this cross is really a sword for conquest. And next day he goes with this idea to battle winds and he says that therefore Christianity is to be born as, an, as a weapon. So in the case of Western, in the case of Roman uh, appropriation of Christianity, the gladiator takes over yoga. In the case of Emperor Ashoka, the gladiator surrenders to the yoga. And these are two different systems. So at the bottom I have what I call the yogi's, di the yogi's dilemma when facing a gladiator's aggression. Imagine you are a yogi, and this is a question I ask my, you know, those who are very spiritually inclined people, I know lots of them in the audience. That, you know, if you're a yogi and a gladiator comes to you and says, I'm going to kill you, and you can't change his mind, you can't run away, the question is, what do you do? Uh, one option is that you don't fight and he kill you. That is one option you have. The second option is you become a gladiator and fight him. And you could beat him, but you're no longer a yogi because you become the gladiator. You, you're, you've used the, you turned into a gladiator to fight the gladiator, so you're no longer the yogi. So the dilemma is, either way, you're not a yogi. So what do you do? I mean, what do you do? Indian civilization has to solve this dilemma. And we will see two ways. One is Mahatma Gandhi, the other is Bhagavad Gita. Uh, Non-violent and violent. Where you remain the yogi within, but you fight the gladiator if you win. We come to that. Okay. But let's keep this in, uh, as an idea. So this is the dilemma of Indian civilization, the yogi's dilemma. Now, the, I mentioned there was a scenario B, which I'll just quickly get rid of, and then we go to scenario C. Scenario B is where somebody says, Indian culture will win, but the nation will be gone. And who cares? Nation is gone, we don't care. We, we, the culture should win. And, and, and that is uh, scenario B. So the yogi lets the gladiator take over, but he does it with a, with a glorifying mindset saying, you know, I'll be gone, I'll be dead, but my yoga will win because I've taught him the pranayama and his breathing and he'll, uh, as a gladiator, he'll do his breathing and even though he'll finish me off, the point is that uh, I'm sacrificing myself, but the yoga will live through the gladiator. But in reality, that doesn't happen. Uh, the pranayama gladiator will just become a better gladiator. He'll just become a tougher gladiator. I mean, they're using yoga nidra for US troops in Iraq. Not to turn them into yogis, but better fighters. Okay. So scenario B is just a very graceful, dignified, respectable way of ending up in scenario A. So therefore, I'll dispose of it.
So now let's talk to talk about scenario C, which is where I wanted to conclude my talk. Scenario C is where Indian civilization survives. India, India survives as a nation and thrives, and may have something to offer to the world. Now here there are two possibilities. One is that India solves the yogi's dilemma, and the second is that India does not solve the yogi's dilemma and becomes a gladiator in order to survive. In the first scenario, India solves the yogi's dilemma, and the gentleman there was absolutely right. Uh, there is Gandhi Satyagraha, is a model against the gladiator civilization, and there is the Gita's uh, uh, you know war against the gladiator. In both cases, it's a very difficult thing to do, and I'm, I, and the the, I, the idea is there, but I'm not sure we as Indians are ready for it because the amount of sacrifice and the self-discipline it takes is incredible. But what it says is remain the yogi inside, but be tough on the outside. So don't let them walk over you, don't let them take advantage of you, you must fight them to win. But do not turn into hatred. Do, uh, you, know, in your, you, you carry out your dharma in the Kurukshetra, and which means you have to fight. But it doesn't, uh, you don't turn into their mindset and their mentality. It's a very difficult thing, and it is not something I can discuss in two minutes or even 45 minutes. But this is a topic which is very central, I uh, feel, for the survival of Indian civilization, as a civilization. The obstacles to this are, India lacks the hard power of economics, governance, military, geopolitics. India also has a clash of soft power internally, because its own discourse is colonized. The moment you talk about civilization, they will say, which civilization? Are you talking about his civilization or that one civilization? They try to break you up into many camps and make you fight, so that you will conclude that it's too complicated, not worth it. And then there is this internal clash of nation versus its fragments. <laughs> Similar to a transplanted organ, which is facing rejection by the body's immune system. If when you have a transplanted organ, the body's immune system might reject it because they are not compatible with each other. So you have to lower your immunity with drugs, so that this, uh, this harmony. So the, but when you lower your immunity to create harmony inside, you become vulnerable to infection from the outside. So as you, it's like saying, don't have national defense in India, national security in India, anti-terrorism in India, because this will create harmony with minorities. But then you become vulnerable to external threats. So this is the dilemma. This is a kind of an internal clash that India faces. And, and the final obstacle India faces is loftiness, apathy, otherworldliness, and all those kind of things we talked about. This is my concluding slide. Uh, I have said three things. Uh, there is a global reality of three major civilizations at least and more, uh, and their competition will intensify for self-interest. Uh, we can wish otherwise, but this is the reality. India is a major playground and battleground for these civilizations. That's the, my view on the global reality. The reality of India is that there are internal fragmentation, which is worsening. The disruptive forces that Hegdeji talked about are getting worse. And this is supported by a cycle of vote banks, quotas, and bribes, and so on. And minorities are becoming branch offices for global nexuses and are receiving funding, ideology, and political support. And, and therefore, this, this is, these are centrifugal forces threatening India's unity. The future, I see that presently India lacks the civilizational consensus and power necessary to survive as a nation state in a dangerous world. India itself will disintegrate and its parts will be assimilated into others and India's culture may well flourish as part of other, people, other civilizations. That is one scenario. Or, if Indian, India's civilizational foundation can be secured, it would be a key solution provider to world problems. Thank you very much. Thank you others who spoke very eloquently and more collaboratively about uh, the contribution which Indian civilization has to make or can make. But that requires a very hospitable resident, some very hospitable soil. I believe that neither China nor Islam will produce that uh, soil for us. <clears throat> the only place where we can probably make some contribution is the United States. And don't you think they have the wisdom for both the United States and India? Uh, to sort of synthesize their efforts and produce some kind of a new synthetic product which we then propagate, circulate and force it down the throats of others. 
I think this is very, very good. And I subscribe to this idea. I subscribe to the idea of a merger of two strong parties, not a weak party looking for help from a strong party. If India wants to have a synthesis with the United States or with the West to create a new world order, I think that's a winning combination. But it requires Indians to be more self-respectful of their own civilization first. Because we cannot go with a self-abusive or with a kind of a self denigration self-flagellation attitude which exists to a large extent. A very cynical attitude exists in a large section of India. Especially uh, the study of India in the academy and in the school textbooks is very apologetic uh, about, uh, about Indian civilization. And going with this sort of a mindset uh, puts us in a weak position to ask the United States to have the synthesis. United States is also very desperate, as I told you, with China and Islam, and looking for India as a possible partner. And if India can manage its uh, fragmentation forces uh, and, and project a positive civilization, uh, then I think what uh, uh, Mr. Jait Manani suggested is a fantastic idea and very wise. I have just one question to ask. That is, why is it, despite the presence, a large presence of audiovisual print media in the country, the economy has got integrated? you find the forces of uh, separatism, uh, uh, it's becoming very strong, which was not, uh, say, a few decades ago. Yeah, I'm just a point which I want to make is, when you talk about the conflict between the Dalit and Brahmins in terms of sex, don't you think it's a positive development that people who were deprived of their rights are asserting themselves? Yes. What we found peace thousand years ago was peace at the graveyard. Mm -hmm. Now it's a fight for peace with justice. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I think it's a very important point. The, the issue, uh, if there were a presidential system, if there were a presidential system of uh, governance, it would force uh, large parties. You would not be a small party would not even be viable in a presidential system. Uh, it would bring stability because then all the factions and all the voices would have to reconcile internally within the party. If you notice in the U.S. elections, there was a big fight between Obama and Hillary Clinton. But uh, if it had been India, there would have been a Democrat for Clinton party separated. And they would have made their own separate vote bank. Uh, the reason they don't split off like Indians do at the drop of a hat is because then in the presidential system, a little party has got no viability, you got nothing, you got nobody. So there is no Mormon party and a Hispanic party and a black party and a Muslim party in the USA. There is no Texan party, there is no party of gays. You don't have those parties because they would not be viable. So what America offers is a very interesting combination. There is diversity of identity but a unity of politics. Here we have a diversity of identity which then becomes a diversity of politics. So when diverse identities become divisive politics, you have a dangerous situation. So in, I, I really do not think that the parliamentary system was a good design for such a diverse range of identities because it's a recipe for fragmentation into smaller and smaller and smaller units. And if you can just get a vote bank and get yourself in a little bit of power that gives you some negotiating clout, then you offer the vote bank from quotas, you will be their broker and negotiate quotas for them. <laughs> And at the, at the, even at the cost of the national interest, you will do it for them. So you are maximizing a small group's interest by hurting the, maxi, the nation's interest. And in exchange, you are getting some bribes when they, they are letting you take bribes when you are shared for it. So corruption and uh, vote banking and uh, quotas lobbying are all hand in hand. And I think the whole system has to change into a presidential system. Thank you for that panoramic presentation. Uh, and my question actually was uh, in a way you know, asked by the previous uh, person, but let me put it in a different way. Uh, do you think it's a good idea to have a self-critical approach as part of your foundational culture which you are proposing? Yes, and uh, we've always had a self-critical approach because uh, we are required to be debaters. In Indian culture is based on argumentation and debating. Uh, uh, it is not dogma, it is not uh, canons, it is not final truths. So the, I, the ethos of arguing and uh, uh, you know, self-reform uh, uh, is there. And there have been many reform movements from within. The, the, the whole bhakti movement and before that many, many movements. It's not just recent bhakti movement, which is relatively recent, but much earlier also. You could think of Buddhism as a kind of reform movement, a lot of these. And they did not require foreign intervention. 
Uh, they did not require somebody have to go to Washington or London and present a case before a hearing committee and get intervention. It did not require that. When you have foreign intervention, then the people who are making decisions do not have a vested interest in their own lives. They do not have a vested interest directly on what happens in my territory. So they can play with, what, with my territory without living there and having a direct vested interest. Whereas if you resolve things internally, uh, then you have all the parties who are involved are in the same boat. And if the boat sinks, they're all in it. So I, I feel that the debate is important, the tensions are important, the, these internal things are, have a value. But what bothers me is when the fragments get appropriated by global forces, which is what has happened now. Thank you very much. A very vocal member. Yeah, very vocal. All the time we have to shout in Parliament. <laughs> uh, Mr. Malhotra indeed was a thought provoking. And I, I feel your thesis and your presentation should become a discussion paper not only in universities but uh, FIKIs and CIIs and wherever, including Parliament. So it indeed uh, is a great presentation. And when you started, I got a little worried. But towards the end, I was quite satisfied that we'll survive. And I'll tell you why we'll survive. As long as we have sharp minds like you, Mr. Malhotra, you have analyzed the future to come. So when you analyze a problem, when you diagnose, the medicine for that will also come from within. And we are not going to look outside for certain. Because this is a very sharp presentation. And it's very impressive. I have very quickly uh, one question and other coming. The question is, you know, I was a little confused between this yogi and gladiator syndrome, you know. Because Shiva is the greatest yogi. Yes. And Shiva has the greatest power of destruction. Right? So, where is it written that the yogi cannot stand up and destroy the destroyer? If somebody is there to destroy, then the yogi stands up to safeguard, not his own thing, but the human beings at large. So where is this uh, confusion? Well, the question uh, on the yogi gladiator, and I do apologize, I will be very quick on that because I'm time sensitive. Uh, the, you're absolutely right. The Gita's message is also the same, that the yogi can fight the gladiator on the gladiator's terms without becoming a gladiator. And as in, you mentioned in your own uh, words, you said, uh, the yogi is fighting without a self-interest. Now that I would underline, without a self-interest. As long as he's fighting with that detachment and that uh, attitude that I'm doing it for the common good, the dharma is what I'm with, what the Gita says you do it for, then fighting hard and tough is okay. Uh, but the gladiator archetype is the kind who is doing it for a selfish cause. That is the difference, the yogi fighting and the gladiator fighting. Now, as far as your second comment is concerned, I think it's a brilliant comment that India is a, is a knowledge, has been a knowledge economy for a very long time. In fact, my foundation is doing a whole, about 20 volumes on the history of Indian contributions to science and technology. We came out with three, we have two more, and we have a total of 20 planned. The idea is to do away with this uh, stereotype that Indians didn't have knowledge, they didn't have technology, they were some other worldly mystical people, didn't know anything about the world. That's really not true. And uh, our, the problem I'm having is, even after investing 10 years to produce these books, and there are top scholars doing it, there is very little interest to teach it. Uh, there is very little interest in colleges to teach this, because they rather teach history of science as a Western history. They rather not bring in Indian contributions. Uh, there are occasional papers here and there. We organize some seminars and conferences, but we thought it would take on like a bang in a big way. It just hasn't. So there is some kind of a mindset, like the gentleman there was telling us, a mindset which doesn't seem to uh, bring Indian traditions and Indian knowledge uh, as relevance in the modern context. So somehow you are either a traditionalist uh, or you are a modernist. If you are a modernist, then you have to abandon tradition, which is not true at all. The, the use of tradition for today is a very relevant thing. But uh, uh, don't you think this must, be, must have been done with a motive? So that this is not propagated. Yeah, I think this we there's a Macaulay motive. Yeah, there's a whole history of this. Uh, one of the books I'm writing is the history of Indology, the study of India by others, and now today the U.S. South Asian studies and how Indians have internalized this, and that is a problem. It's a it's a it's a neo-colonized mind. That's true. I have a 
I salute Mr. Malhotra for an absolutely brilliant, thought-provoking speech and his paper presentation. And most of all, what hit me was the idea of nationhood, which is really missing in our, in our children, in our population. And I feel as if it's the children and the education where we really need to bring this about, integrate it into our education. And I don't think we can depend on our politicians for this because they're too busy with themselves. We need Infinity Foundation and people like you to think about how we can bring about this change in the very foundation, you know, at the stage of school. Not even management schools or business schools. It's at this stage of education in schools, how we can bring this change. Thank you. You just hit the right thing here. We talked about yoga and the gladiators. And we have the saint... Guru Gobind Singh, who was a saint warrior. I think we need to have more of that to protect ourselves and still be in the yogic fashion so that we have good life.